Thank you. So, yeah, thank you to the organizers for the invitation, and thank you for everybody for being here. Um, yeah, so as I have said, the most important thing to know about me is that I'm a number theorist, <laughs> and so that means I have ulterior motives. Um, I, uh, I, I want to indoctrinate you in number theory, but also in illustration. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is these, these sorts of subjects, the questions maybe that come up in number theory and then have interesting geometric and dynamic connections. Um, and sometimes those things wouldn't be um, understood or even discovered without playing around with um, computer illustration, for example. And so there's going to be a lot of, a lot of pictures. Um, yeah, so I'm going to sort of try to frame the lectures as a bunch of uh, a few number theory questions that have these connections to dynamics and geometry. And I don't know anything about dynamics, for example. Um, and so hopefully some of these connections will be things that maybe some of you will be interested in following up on. Um, OK. So I'm going to start with these questions. So the first question that I want to ask is about Diophantine approximation. So which complex numbers can be well approximated by algebraic numbers? Now, before we get there, we have to go back to the classical question, which is um, in the real line. So before we get to the complex numbers, how can we approximate real numbers? And here, it's most natural to ask about approximating with rational numbers. So my fundamental question is just how do the rationals live inside the real line? And this picture here, what I've done is I've put a dot on each of the rational numbers, but I've sized it so that it indicates how complex that number is, the arithmetic complexity of that number. So I'm just using the denominator. So a big dot means small denominator, right? So those four dots, there are integers. And then in between them, you see halves, and then thirds, and so on and so forth. Okay? And the first thing that you see in a picture like this is that the rational numbers are repelling one another. Right? If you have co-prime denominators, you're not going to be able to get very close unless um, at least one of them has quite a large denominator. Okay? And that you can kind of capture visually. So we're interested in um, approximating a, uh, a real number by rational numbers. So look at the theorem before you look at the picture. So this is Dirichlet's theorem. And it says that you can tell whether a, a real number is irrational or not by asking how well approximated it is by rationals. So here, I'm interested in my number alpha. I want to approximate it by p over q. But again, I can get as close as I want if I'm allowed to use a big denominator. So the question is really, can I get startlingly close with a small denominator. So my measure of the goodness of my approximation is in terms of the denominator um, uh, q there. So I'm asking for p over q, which is within 1 over q squared, which is sort of surprisingly good um, for that particular denominator. OK, and uh, some number is irrational if and only if there are actually infinitely many distinct rationals which satisfy this inequality, which are good approximations. So one way to visualize this in the picture here, I've taken actually the last picture, and I've just expanded those balls, those disks. So here I have, have I got the mouse on here? OK. So here is an integer right here. And around it, I have this great big disk. And my disks are translucent white disks. So as I pile them up, it gets whiter. OK. So here's one big disk around 1. Here's one big disk around 0. And where they overlap here is, this, is uh, slightly gray compared to black if there's just one disk there, right? And then so these white parts that are lit up, those are the parts where there's lots of disks overlapping, okay? And Dirichlet's theorem then says that um, the things which are under infinitely many disks are the things which are irrational. And there's, so this can be proven with pigeonhole principle. Many of you probably know the proof. Um, the flip side to this is Roth's theorem, which says that if we try to do better, so we try to go to 1 over q to the 2 plus epsilon instead of 1 over q squared, then the algebraic numbers pop out. They fail to satisfy this anymore. So if you have an algebraic number alpha in the real line, um, then um, of degree at least 2, okay, not a rational number, then there exist only finitely many distinct p over q that uh, approximate it to the exponent 2 plus epsilon. Okay? So I'm making the disks ever so slightly smaller, and the um, algebraic numbers pop out. So the question then is, what about approximating uh, complex numbers? Now, with complex numbers, you're off the real line, so you're not going to be able to approximate by rationals. So maybe the next best thing would be to take algebraic numbers of higher degree. So maybe approximating, for example, by quadratics, solutions to quadratic equations. Okay. So that's my first 
question. And I'm going to start with that today. But first, I want to give you just a, a hint and look at what the other questions um, are that I'm going to talk about over the week. So the next one is about Apollonian circle packings. And I'll tell you what that is in one second. The question is, what are the curvatures of a prim primitive integral Apollonian circle packing? All right. So what is an Apollonian circle packing? So if I take three circles that are all tangent to one another and have disjoint interiors, so I'm going to actually, that outer circle there, its interior is on the outside. Its interior contains infinity to satisfy that. Then um, Apollonius in ancient Greece uh, asked some questions, one particular case of which was, how many ways can I add a fourth circle to this picture, which is tangent to the ones that are already there? So if you look at the picture, you can probably visualize where they are. There's two solutions to this problem. There's two ways I can add a fourth circle and be tangent to everything that was there to begin with. And so to make an Apollonian circle packing, I'm just going to add those in. So we'll make them part of the picture. And now, um, now not all the circles are tangent to one another. Those two new ones aren't touching. But there's a new triple, for example, over here, these three, for which I can ask the same question and add in new solutions. So what this amounts to doing is every time you see a little triangle here, there's going to be another circle you can add, which is tangent to the three sides. Okay? And if you do that forever, you get an Apollonian circle packing. You get this fractal. All right. So far, so good. Um, so Descartes and Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia were in correspondence. And they wrote letters to one another. And in those letters, they collaborated, in fact, um, to prove this theorem. So what I'm going to do is look at the curvatures of those circles. So curv curvature is 1 over the radius. So I'm going to call those A, B, C, D, where I've chosen four that are all mutually tangent. Then they satisfy this quadratic relationship. Okay, and that's a sort of elementary geometry problem. It's not easy, but it's um, doable. And you'll notice that, in particular, I posed the problem to begin with with three circles, and then I was adding in the two solutions of Apollonius. If you start with three, A, B, C, and you're asking what are the possibilities for D, it's a quadratic equation in D. So there's two solutions, just like geometrically we saw two circles. And they satisfy this relationship just from the quadratic equation. And so um, that means that if we get to the point in the Apollonian circle packing where you have four curvatures, A, B, C, D, which are all integral, then when you add in that d prime, it's also going to be an integer. And so that's kind of weird. And so what you get is cur curvatures, which are integers, all the way down in the entire packing. And so this is the moment when the number theorists wake up <laughs> and they say, what are these integers, right? And so that's one of the questions that I want to answer. I want to know what integers appear in an Apollonian circle packing where you have all integers. So this is called an integral Apollonian circle packing. If they don't all have a common factor, because you could all multiply them all by two or something, it wouldn't be very exciting. We call it a primitive integral Apollonian circle packing. OK, so that's question number two. And it seems completely divorced from question number one. But all of these things actually sort of share behind the scenes geometric connections and stuff. Any questions right now? OK. All right, so that will come later. And then I have one more question to motivate. Um, so this is really a number theorist's question on the face of it a little bit more, which is I'm interested in studying imaginary quadratic fields, like the Gaussians or something. And um, OK, so that's K. OK is my notation for the ring of integers in that field. And so OK lives in C. So I could look at PSL2 OK as a subgroup of PSL2 C, which you know as the collection of Mobius transformations of the complex plane the extended complex plane. And so um, this is this uh, group called the Bianchi group. Um, it has a, a natural geometric interpretation because you can think of it as Mobius transformations. And on the extended complex plane, Mobius transformations take circles to circles. So we could try to draw a picture of this group by looking at the orbits in there. So what I want to do is I want to take the real line inside the complex plane. That's a circle, right? And I want to do the orbit of that under all these Mobius transformations whose um, coefficients are taken from the Gaussian integers. All right. Now, if I let this be C instead of the Gaussian integers, I would get every possible circle. But I want to choose just those. It's still going to fill it in completely. But if I'm careful about how I draw it, then I can see the structure. So here's drawing it down to a certain size. And you can see that there's a ton of structure in this picture. And maybe you can even see how it's related to the last question. <laughs> uh, 
And so um, this picture should somehow be telling me something about the number theory, because it's the number theory that's controlling which Mobius transformations I'm looking at. Sorry, can I ask that? Yeah. So this is, I'm taking the real line, and I'm doing all of the Mobius transformations where my entries are allowed to be Gaussian integers. Each of those gives me a circle, and I'm drawing all the circles down to a particular size. I stop after a while so it doesn't get completely filled in. And so I can draw the same picture um, for other rings of integers. Yeah. Oh, the colors, um, so it turns out that in this picture, if you scale appropriately, all of the curvatures are integers, and I picked the colors according to mod something or other, just, just to add some interest to the picture. It's not really relevant at the moment. Uh, yeah. Does the curvature have a circle to the trace? Of the Mobius transformation? Yeah. You can read it off the Mobius transformation. It's not the trace. I'll show you what it is later. Yeah. All right, so just to show you some of the variety that you get from different um, rings of integers here. And after a while, they actually get disconnected. So there's some, there's clearly this wants to have more circles in it than it has, right? And this is my, my favorite number field now because of this. I like this picture. Okay. So, so that was sort of the, the motivational question. So now I'm going to go back to the approximation for today. Okay. So I've developed a bit of vertigo. I don't do well with blackboards, especially these gigantic sliding ones. So I'm going to be working on here. Um, okay, so I wanted to mention, by the way, that at my website, If you go there and you click on teaching, you'll find a link to the materials. So I have, like, I'll, I'll put up these slides from today and all that sort of stuff, and the notes and whatnot. So that'll all be there. Let's pick a more cheerful color. Okay, so, um, so I want to start by going back to a story that I'm sure many people in here know, um, which is the classical continued fraction story, uh, but the way that Carolyn Series tells this story. Um, okay, so from her perspective, this is really a story about this group. So here, the plus there just means I'm taking non-negative entries, all right, of SL2. And this is, I think of it as acting on P1 of Q, say. So I'm looking at the structure, the rational numbers inside the real line um, this way. And this is generated um, by two generators. So if you start with the identity, then you can sort of give a tree of all of the elements um, of SL2+. plus. So I would call this guy left and this guy right. So this guy on the right here is translation by one, right? Um, and then you can sort of continue this way. And if I multiply on the right, then I can continue this tree for as long as I like. All right, and um, okay, and so this is the uh, fairy tessellation. Let's see, maybe I need to make it a little smaller. Okay, so what this is, this is the orbit. Oops. of, say, the imaginary axis, maybe from zero to infinity under, if you like, PSL2Z, you can make different choices depending how much you want to repeat things. Um, and so what it does is it's breaking up the upper half plane. So this is a picture of the upper half plane here. And the way that Carolyn Series describes continued fractions is to take a geodesic, which is heading out from the imaginary axis and is heading down to whatever um, real number of interest that you might have, okay? And so if you're given such a thing, then essentially we're going to look at that geodesic and as it passes down, you're going to get a sort of cutting sequence through the fairy tessellation. 
And what I want to do is think of if I'm heading this way, this is left in my triangle. And if I'm heading this way, I call that right. So as you're traveling along, if I see one corner on my, you know, if I see one corner on my, OK, two corners on my left, then I call it left. OK, whatever, right? All right, and so then you get a cutting sequence of triangles, which might look like left, right, and I'll just accumulate how many times I do each of them in an exponent, and so on and so forth. And this is the same thing as looking at the limit of these matrix products. So if I call this guy the matrix for left and the matrix for right, so right corresponds to taking a step to the right, so it would move me from, for example, this triangle here to this next one over here. Um, then I'm actually looking at this um, matrix product, which is continuing off to the right. So it looks something like I'm going to do my left matrix some number of times, and then my right matrix some number of times, and so on. Okay? And then you get your continued fraction approximations by evaluating. So if I take this up to some particular point, it's going to continue farther, but I take it up to some particular point, then that'll give me an approximation um, if I evaluate it at um, either 0, 1, or 1, 0. You have to figure out the details slightly, which corner of the triangle, essentially. So basically, what you're doing um, is you're starting in this, this region. Let me draw another color. You're starting in this region here. And um, you think of from that region, you have two choices. You could go over here, or you could go to this region down here. Say maybe you make that choice. Then under that um, Mobius transformation corresponding to that matrix, you change this triangle to that triangle. And then from here, you have two choices as to which bubble to continue into, and based on where alpha is, you pick one of those, right? So you're giving sort of driving directions to get down to alpha, left, right, left, right, left, right. Okay, so any questions about this, this picture? This is Carolyn's series way of thinking of continued fractions. Yeah? Right, so I'm thinking of it as the direction of travel of my geodesic, and so then it's like left, right as regards the tree over here. Or you can think of it as your geodesic ends here, enters here, and it'll have either, like, in the direction of travel, if you're traveling along that light ray, you see two corners of the triangle you're in on one side and one on the other. That's how you differentiate. Uh, hyperbolic geodesic. Yes. Yes, absolutely. This is the upper half plane, and we are using a hyperbolic geodesic. Maybe since you mentioned count, like, this is a beautiful, what they call, birds of a map with all Yes. It's really fun to read. <laughs> And in fact, if you go to my website there, I've put a copy of it there because it's just so wonderful. Yes, and it tells this story in greater detail. Um, other questions? OK. So, um, so we have this story. And, but you're perhaps, you know, maybe some people have seen sort of uh, the more usual classical continued fraction story. So. I just want to briefly connect it to that. The idea there is that you expand some number alpha you're interested in, same alpha as above, as you, know, you take its integer part. You can do this on a calculator, right? You take its integer part, and then you invert. Take its integer part, and you invert. And you keep doing this for as long as you like. And if it's a rational number, this will end. Otherwise, it'll keep going. And you think of it kind of you know, analogous to a decimal expansion or something, right? It's just some way of, of giving in, in closer and closer detail your number alpha. Um, and then the approximations here are just the truncations. So Pn over Qn just means that you're going to take A0 plus A1 plus and so on. And then you're going to get to An, and you're going to truncate there. Okay? And those should be somehow good approximations to alpha. And they really are. They're better approximations than you get by, say, a decimal expansion, which is, of course, a very arbitrary thing to do to the real numbers, right? <laughs> this is a much more natural thing to do to the real numbers. Um, and these actually will be good approximations in the sense of Dirichlet's theorem that we saw earlier. So are the A uh, and A1 really in the first thing, too? Um, yes, actually, that's sort of the punchline, <laughs> which is that, in fact, I use the same letters A0, A1, and stuff up here. And these are, in fact, the same AI. 
So you can, with you know, working out some details, and I put this um, in the notes in more detail so it can be an, an exercise if you haven't done this before, you can work out that, um, that these really are the same story. So traditionally, I think uh, continued fractions were studied in this very algebraic way without the geometric intuition. And I think the geometric story is just so pretty that you, you shouldn't do it that way, right? You should do it from the, from the tessellation. Okay. Um, okay, I did want to sort of point out one more thing here. Um, let me get another copy of this picture. So, oops, I always do that. So, um, so imagine that we have our, our alpha somewhere down here. I don't know where. Where? That, that is not very geodesic y. <laughs> okay, maybe that's part of a geodesic. Um, so, as we're going down, we can label, so this looks like we're turning left and then left again, and now we're turning right and so on. And we're thinking of the series of triangles like this, and they have endpoints on the boundary of the upper half plane. And then this triangle goes to this triangle at the next step, and it has this endpoint here, and then we go to this triangle, which has this endpoint, and so on. Those are the good approximations. Okay, those are exactly the PN over QN, or at least if you choose the right corner of your triangle, you have to, you have to decide which one is closer and use that one. But there's, there's always a couple of details in here, but basically those are the good approximations as you go down. It doesn't really. Yeah, you can kind of imagine like if I, if I picked a different geodesic, I'm going to do the same set of triangles to get there. So you can imagine coming down from infinity, in fact, if you want. It's a little easier. Other questions? OK. Um, maybe I'll say one more thing about these um, approximations, which is just you can get these by, I think I said this on the first page, so I just want to emphasize that basically um, the reason they're the corners there is because if you think about what we're doing, we're applying a bunch of Mobius transformations. We're, we're, cutting, we're truncating this somewhere like the nth position, and so we have a finite series of Mobius transformations. It's taking this outer triangle whose points were obtained as zero, which is zero over zero, so the vector zero, zero, if we think of the, um, the rationals as P1. Zero over one. Isn't it zero, one? <laughs> Sorry, thank you. I don't know what zero over zero would be. <laughs> and this is one over one, right? So the vector one, one. And then infinity over up here somewhere, quite a bit farther away than that, is one over zero, right? And so um, what we want to do, if we want to get the, those um, vertices, is we're just going to evaluate this. You have to decide which vertex you, you're interested in, but you evaluate at those points to see the vertices, OK? So it becomes, the continued fraction expansion just becomes, algebraically speaking, just this um, product of matrices, which is quite a bit nicer than this recursive definition here to deal with. OK. OK, so now I want to show you some pictures. Let's go. Okay, that seems to be working. Okay, so now I just want to show you sort of visually um, how I'm thinking about this process in a slightly different way. So I, I've been saying P1, right? Um, I'm thinking of the rational numbers as P1 of Z or P1 of Q, if you like. So what is this? It means that I'm taking the lattice Z squared and an element is a ray out from the origin, right? So a rational number for me is a slope. And I can think about, I really want to think, I really want to do this in a very particular way. I want to put myself at the origin, looking out from the origin, and I'm going to see, if I look at a particular slope, I'm going to see the closest element of z squared, and that's the rational number in lowest form. Okay? And so then it's the vector 3, 1, for example, for this guy up here, right? Does this, does this mouse work? Oh, it does. Cool. Oops. All right. So now I'm just going to um, illustrate this process. So this is z squared in the plane, and now I'm going to zoom myself down to the origin. 
And I'm doing this just so that you can see what the lattice looks like as you do this. So I'm actually going to enter that ball in the middle. And now as I fall down into the plane, I am now viewing, I'm now I'm turning that lattice into the projective um, viewpoint, right? I'm looking out from the origin and I'm seeing the rational numbers. Okay. So this, the, you know, this picture that we were just looking at, it looks a lot like the picture that I showed at the beginning with Dirichlet's theorem, right? So, so what am I actually doing when I do the Fairy tessellation? Well, I am standing at the origin on the right-hand side here, and I look at zero and I look at one. Now, apologies, there's some sort of left-right flipping thing going on here, just like, forgive me for many minor sins throughout. Um, so at zero, one there, I'm looking out in this direction here, right? And then this is looking up this way. And then in between, to, to do the Fairy subdivision, to figure out that midpoint that I'm gonna add two more geodesics to, I actually do the vector addition of the vector 0, 1 and the vector 1, 1, right? And so that means we're doing this mediant operation where we add the numerators and add the denominators and we get something in between the two of them. That's how I know where that next pair of geodesics is gonna go inside the fairy tessellation. And, um, and so then we can continue doing this and we're just doing vector addition in the, in the lattice z squared. And we can fill that out. Okay, so that's how we build the Fairy subdivision. So here's a picture of actually doing that with the median operation. I just couldn't resist, right? So I had to, had to do this. <laughs> there are far too many rationals. <laughs> All right, and, uh, and, and I also can't resist. Oh, maybe I did resist, okay. <laughs> Never mind, I was gonna compare to the decimal, which just, <laughs> anyway. Okay, so now I want to go back to this question of approximation, which is you're gonna look out from the origin at some slope. So this is pi, at slope pi, and of course you're never gonna hit the lattice at slope pi, but as you head out, you're gonna have near misses, right? And these are the rationals which are fairly close to pi. And um, famously, 22 sevenths is a really good approximation to pi, and it's so close you can't even tell it's barely off center there, right? And so that's why the Fairy tessellation gives you the good approximations is because it's exactly picking up what this video is doing, right? The geodesic um, where it hits at alpha, this isn't the geodesic, but where it hits at alpha is inside a plane, not a line. And then you look out and see what the nearby stuff is and the Fairy tessellation is somehow the structure of the nearby stuff. I, <laughs> apologies. <laughs> okay. All right, so let's see. Um, okay, so we want to go back to this question of Diophantine approximation. All right, and so this is this question of approximating to within, say, one over Q squared, and we have the continued fraction approximation of alpha, the convergence of that, the Pn's over Qn's that you get out of that process, they satisfy this. Okay, so that's one way of getting good approximations. Now you might modify this question, and I'll just briefly mention um, the Lagrange spectrum which maybe some of you have thought about. Um, so I might modify this in the, the, the simplest way, which would be to add a constant. So I could say, okay, I want an even slightly better approximation by making C something a little bit bigger than one here in this um, picture. And what happens is you ask, does Dirichlet's theorem continue to hold? And um, it'll continue to hold as you increase C until you get to square root of five. And then for a very select collection of rational numbers, it will fail. And those are the rational numbers whose continued fraction expansions are the worst in some sense. They end, their tail has to look like all ones eventually. Okay. Um, so some of them will fail, but most will still be fine. And then it'll carry on like that for a while until you get to the next element. And there's a sort of, dis for a while, there's this discrete collection of spots where particular um, um, 
real numbers uh, cease to satisfy Dirichlet's theorem with the constant um, based on their continued fraction expansion. And so Carolyn Series has this wonderful article um, in the Intelligencer which explains this um, and, and its connections to geodesics. And they can be um, nicely described as geodesics on a punctured torus. And I'm not going to go down that path, but um, I suggest that you read that paper because it's just wonderful. Okay. It's different from the other intelligence paper. She has like two of these classic, amazing papers. Oh, this is the one that, I, were you talking about the other one? There's the other one, which is non-Euclidean geometry, Ferry fractions, and oh. geometry. She has two amazing ones. I okay, think. maybe yeah. I should go put that one in the drive too. This is the one I was talking about that talks about the, she calls it the Markov spectrum. Um, okay, but my question is to talk about Diophantine approximation in the complex numbers. And of course, you kind of want some of this same story, because this is such a satisfying story, to exist in the complex numbers as well. So first of all, um, we want to start with an alpha, which is um, a complex number, and for the most part, not a real number. We'll stay off the real line where we kind of have already uh, understood a little bit of something, because they're kind of two different cases, and they really kind of behave a little bit differently. But now we can't approximate by rationals, because there aren't any rationals out there in the rest of the complex plane. So we're going to approximate by beta, which is an algebraic number of degree. And let's just bound the degree. So this is one way you could do it. There's lots of choices, right? You could, you could choose to approximate by something from uh, a number field, fixed number field. But I'm just going to pick um, algebraic of degree at most d. OK. Well, that is an option. That would be approximating the Gaussian integers. So that would be fixing a number field and doing it. Oh, yes, by right. Yeah. So that would be a choice. This is, um, I'm going to make a different choice. That's all. That's a good question, and we'll come back to it actually eventually, I think. But. Okay, how am I for time right now? I have no clue. Yeah, you have uh, 25 minutes. I have 25, so I'm halfway through about. Okay. Okay, so Coxma gives a way of um, talking about this question, which is we're going to take um, this exponent. Remember the exponent that was a 2 in Dirichlet's theorem and a 2 plus epsilon in Roth's theorem? We want to look at that exponent. So we're going to take, um, oh, oops. So, okay. So what I want to do is I want to ask um, when is there infinitely many? And we saw that in Dirichlet's theorem, um, there was when there was an exponent of two, there were infinitely many approximations, and then we went to two plus epsilon, there was not any longer. Okay. So as the exponent increased, the um, infinitude of the number of approximations stopped. Right. So we want to take the max, or I should say soup here of the um, exponents for which there are infinitely many beta of degree uh, less than or equal to d that satisfy that they are good approximations. Now, I have to be a little bit careful here, so I want to measure the distance as 1 over something to the k. But now, remember before I used the denominator of q, which was a measure of the complexity, the arithmetic complexity of q. Here, we have algebraic numbers, and we need a measure. So what it is is it's called. Uh, the height, and what the height of beta is, is the largest of its coefficients for the minimal polynomial. Now, it's important here that I minimal, uh, uh, normalize the minimal polynomial so that the um, coefficients are integers and they are coprime. Right, so that fixes a particular choice amongst scalings of the minimal polynomial. And once I've done that, then I can ask, what's the maximal coefficient? And if you do this for a rational number, the coefficients are just p and q, numerator and denominator. And so this is really kind of the same thing that we had before. D equals 1. Yep, the d equals 1 case. OK. So in particular, what we saw before was Dirichlet said that d equals 1, k1 of alpha, is at least 2 when we have a rational, 
and at most two for irrationals, right? Because it was sampling at two and seeing it did or didn't work there. So it gives a, a upper or lower bound depending. So I say again? That I just wrote? So this is K1 of alpha is less than or equal to two for alpha in the rationals and is greater than or equal to two when we're outside the rationals, when we're irrational. Because Dirichlet's theorem is basically checking what happens at two. Do we have infinitely many or approximations or not? So we're checking whether we've passed the supremum or not. Um, and Roth's theorem then asserts that it's actually equal to two for algebraic, if combined with Dirichlet's theorem, for algebraic alpha. Um, okay, so this is where we were, but now phrased more generally. And there's a result of Springuk. I'm not sure how to say this, if anybody knows. For D in general. And this tells us the generic behavior. So for almost all alpha in the reals, it's D plus one. So in particular, for most reals approximated by rationals, d equals one, you get two. And that's what we were seeing. And, um, but that's in the real line. And in fact, it's very different if you're outside the real line. So if you take alpha in the complex numbers, but not in the rational numbers, then it's d plus one over two. It's very different. And you kind of expect this because maybe, I don't know, I mean, well, We'll see some pictures, which will definitely make it seem like the real line is, is very special in the complex plane. OK, so I'm going to show you more pictures now. OK. All right, so what I want to show you a picture of is the following. So we just want to experiment in the same way that we've been experimenting. I want to look in the complex plane, and I want to look at how the um, quadratic algebraic numbers lie in the complex plane. So just like we started by asking about how do the rationals lie inside the real line, I, wanna, I, don't, I don't have rationals anymore in the whole complex plane, but I want to do it for quadratics. So here's a few examples. And um, I have to choose a sizing to get anything interesting. If I were to just draw all the dots, it would just be black, right? <laughs> so if I want to ask a, a sensitive question here, something which is going to tell me something, I need to size the dots in some way. And I want to choose a way which is somehow measuring the complexity. On the slides a moment ago, I used the uh, naive height, which was in terms of the minimal polynomial. And in fact, here I'm going to do something which is slightly different. I'm going to use the discriminant. Okay, So that's b squared minus 4ac for this quadratic polynomial. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of the roots. I'm going to graph where they are, and I'm going to size it by the discriminant so that it has a small discriminant, it gets a big dot. All right, so here's a few examples. and. Um, you can see that there, there's a symmetry, right? Because if you have um, a complex root, you have a complex conjugate pair. So I'm going to throw away the lower half plane, and I'm just going to do it in the upper half plane. I'm also going to throw away the real line, because I'm more interested off the real line. All right. And this is what you get. And it's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> um, and you see, I mean, I think from your experience, you see things in this picture, right? I mean, what do you see in this picture? Say again? The fundamental, domain. the fundamental domain, yeah, absolutely, of SL2Z. Hyperbolic geodesics. What's that? Hyperbolic geodesics. Hyperbolic geodesics, absolutely, right. And there's one other thing that I see in here, just from earlier in this talk. The prior iteration, something there? Yeah, 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 the, the tessellation as well, made out of geodesics. You can kind of see lots of different SL2 orbits in here, maybe. And then you can see the rationals that we had in the real line as well but lying along each geodesic now, right? Very <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I love, you, you, it definitely has this iterative structure where you feel like you're cutting it up into pieces, right? Yeah, so what, when you look at this, I think what you think is, okay, if that picture I drew of the rationals was because I really had z squared and I was looking at it projectively, maybe here I have a lattice and I'm looking at it in the right way somehow. So that's what we want to do. So what's the lattice? Well, the natural thing to think about is, just uh, totally analogously to the rational case, is to take all of the coefficients of your minimal polynomial. 
There's three coefficients, so we'll do a three-dimensional lattice of z cubed, okay? So for a, b, and c in three directions. And the sizing that I used in that picture was the discriminant. So let's, let's see what the discriminant looks like in this picture. So b squared uh, minus 4ac equals zero will be a cone, a double cone out from the origin in some correct orientation. And um, okay, that's where the discriminant is zero. And so what that means, the discriminant classifies the roots. So on the outside of this cone, you get all of the polynomials that have real roots. And on the inside of the cone, you have all the polynomials that have complex roots. Um, if you were to pick other discriminants, so level sets for the discriminant, you would get um, double-sheeted hyperboloids inside or a one-sheeted hyperboloid surrounding your cone. I'm interested in the complex roots, obviously, so I'm interested in the inside of this cone. Okay, so this is another visualization. So here's my lattice, and um, it's just slowly expanding so that you can kind of get a sense of it here. And we're just kind of rotating through space um, so that you can kind of see the patterns that the lattice makes, and these should be reminiscent of that picture, but they're not geodesics, they're straight lines in this picture, right? Now here's the cone, that's the discriminant cone, and I'm interested in the inside, so eventually this picture is going to get around to looking inside. <laughs> and, um, and I want to kind of look down the axis of symmetry of this cone, and I'm going to cut the cone with a perpendicular plane so that I can kind of see what's going on better. So now I have all these dots inside my cone. I'm going to look straight down towards the origin because what I want to do is projectivize. So if I'm going to projectivize, I'm going to pull all of those lattice points towards the origin. And in order to see them, I'm going to choose to um, have them stop when they hit that plane. Okay? So then you can see what a projectivized lattice looks like. Okay? And the size of them just, just has to do with how far away they were. They shrink as they head towards that, uh, that plane. Okay, so that's the picture that we were at. Okay, does everybody understand? Any questions about the, what, what I've drawn? All right, so then um, this is where we're going, right? And this is where we're at. And so what we do is we do a hyperbolic isometry. So that was cl the Klein model of hyperbolic space, that disk inside the cone. And now we just do the hyperbolic isometry, which takes you to the upper half plane model and each of those straight lines becomes a geodesic um, in the upper half plane sense. So you can just watch that again. And so what are we doing? We're taking the lattice we started with was the lattice of coefficients, and what we ended with was the roots. So this is just the quadratic formula. This is what the quadratic formula does. This is one thing you could say is the quadratic formula is a hyperbolic isometry between the Klein model and the upper half plane model of um, the hyperbolic plane. Okay, so that kind of explains the picture. And now that you, you have a little bit of an understanding where the picture comes from, you might ask, you know, so how do we actually get some approximation out of this, right? Um, oh, I was going to show a picture of uh, Steve and Edmund, so we collaborated on drawing these pictures and, and thinking about what implications they had for Diophantine approximation while we were at a special semester um, at ISERM, which was devoted to illustrating mathematics in 2019. That's my son and my co-authors. You might not be able to tell which is which. Um, <laughs> I think they're making a cube up there. That, sorry, did I say co-authors? The co-organizers is what I meant to say, because we were working on the special semester. Okay, um, so here is another picture. This is what you do if you do cubics instead of quadratics. And you can actually see that it avoids the where the quadratics were, right? Those white spaces that it's avoiding were actually where the quadratic geodesics lay. Um, and when you have a cubic, um, so I'm interested in this picture, this is the upper half plane again, or most of it, a piece of it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in when you have complex roots, so that means you have a complex conjugate pair and then one real root. So you actually have three dimensions of, um, well, so you have three roots anyway. Three, three real dimensions of root information. So you can plot it as a position in the plane, and then I, um, we've plotted the real root as the color, so it kind of goes from blue to red, depending on what the real root is. And you get the sense from this picture, I think, that there's so much going on because we're going down from too many dimensions now. Right? We had three dimensions mapping into two dimensions in the last example with the quadratics. Here we now have four coefficients to a cubic, 
and we're kind of squashing too much. If you look, this is a detail of that picture. You can see there's still these like necklaces of dots, right? You still have some of the same sense that there's maybe lattice stuff going on in there, but now they're twisted around and orbiting each other and, and there's much more going, it looks higher dimensional, right? So one thing you can do is you can, um, you can choose um, families. So if you want to uh, deal with something which is one dimension lower, you could make the quadratic and the linear term the same, for example, and then you get this. This is the upper half plane again. So this is I in the middle, and then everything's sort of concentrated to the left of I there. Um, same piece of the upper half plane with a different choice of coefficients. Now I'm having cubic and, and constant the same. And these are just various different families. And here's one where we put three for the quadratic coefficient. So it's a, it's a plane that's off, it's not going through the origin. And so um, there you see the twisting beginning to happen that was evident in the original picture. Um, and here is a, a two-dimensional um, selection of coefficients. So this is a plane that's now being somehow, you can, now you can get a sense for what the geometry might be doing when you go from coefficient space to root space. Um, and so you can run a lot of the same story here. So you can, uh, you can ask for the discriminant locus, and now it's more complicated. You have a sort of lower dimensional piece of it, which is uh, where you have a triple root. These are sort of projectivizations of, um, of what's going on, because it's higher dimensional. And then you have a like, two-dimensional locus where you have a double root, and then that divides the space into three real roots versus two complex conjugate roots together with a real root, which is the part that we were drawing a picture of. Um, so this is just to give you a, a sense that it gets complicated, the geometry. <laughs> and, um, and so another way to visualize what's going on, so that's, this is over in the coefficient space, right? The coefficients of the polynomial. If we move over to the root space, um, we have maybe reduced the dimension too much by just drawing one copy of the upper half plane, right? So maybe we could um, bring that extra real root in and try to do something three-dimensional. So the natural thing to do is to think of the reals as one-dimensional things. So they, this is like I have a tree trunk here. That's, that's as my real number. That's my real number line, the tree trunk. And then each slice of it is where I fix a real number. And then I should have a copy of the upper half plane. So I've drawn it as a disk model of the hyperbolic plane. Okay, and then if you want, you can be like, like that little guy and open it up to be an upper half plane. Okay, and the real line should actually be, it should be a torus. It comes back round through infinity to itself. So these should, really list, they should really live on a torus. And so what we did is um, David Dumas had some software uh, online that he was already interested in, in exploring sort of point clouds, especially point clouds on a torus by chance. Um, and, uh, and so this is playing with his software. Um, and these are the roots. And you can see if I take a slice like a bagel chip, uh, you see a copy of the upper half plane in a disk model. Um, but it gives you much more of a sense of the latticeness of it than the 2D picture does. So you can play with this online if you want. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's with thanks to David Dumas. Okay. And, uh, oh yeah, right. So I did things out of order slightly. Okay, so there's a result of Bujo and Everza which was done on the algebraic side. And it said that there were two different kinds of approximation going on in the complex plane. That some complex numbers were really fundamentally better approximable, they have a different Coxma exponent than other ones. And they give an algebraic condition. I'll write that down for you in one second. Um, but this is showing the, the same phenomenon happening geometrically. So if you pick a complex number which is on one of the geodesics, in the quadratics picture, and you ask to approximate by quadratics, you have more approximations, because you're right on that geodesic, and that geodesic is full of quadratics. If you pick something off the geodesic, you have to pick nearby geodesics, making near misses, and then take rationals off those. And so you're fundamentally worse approximable. There's a really sort of geometric distinction um, there. So let me go back to the notes. So 
Here, I'll leave the exponent definition up here. How am I for time now? Five minutes, maybe? Oh, perfect. OK. Or seven? Yeah. Perfect. So they were interested in approximating um, uh, complex numbers, uh, algebraic complex numbers. And they did this for various different dimensions, but I'm going to write down um, the result for the degree 2 case. So let's suppose that the degree of alpha is bigger than 2, something else. Then what they show is that there's two cases for the Coxman exponent. And one case happens when the following quantities are Q independent um, versus when they're not. Uh, wait, do I mean dependent or independent? So, yeah, that's a higher approximation exponent. So, actually, I mean dependent here. I think I just got it wrong in my notes. Anyway, so what you're doing is you're breaking up according to whether or not this turns out to be the same thing as whether or not you are on a, what we call a rational geodesic, which is to say one of those geodesics that is full of quadratic, one of those geodesics you see in the quadratic picture. That is like you're in the real line. The um, yeah, the yeah, case. exactly. Then it looks like you're in the real line, exactly. Um, so, but this is, this, remember, is for the naive height over here. And in my pictures, I talked about the, um, the discriminant instead. Um, and they're actually very closely related. So you could draw the same picture with the naive height, but it would um, concentrate around the origin and, and, and sort of fade away as you move away. Um, and the discriminant respects the SL2Z action. And so this is an argument for the discriminant actually being maybe a better choice of arithmetic complexity because it's respecting the geometry that's going on in the picture. And then you can also make the argument that you might want to use um, hyperbolic distance. So, so the, I'll just say quickly choices, right, that we're making based on looking at it from this perspective. So the discriminant as arithmetic complexity. And then you can also make the choice to use hyperbolic distance instead of Euclidean distance, which is what the original Coxman exponent was, was phrased in terms of. Um, and then what you get is a, different, a slightly different statement to what they have, where you're looking at, let me see, so in the same context, you have an alpha and so on and so forth. Then there exist only finitely many beta quadratic such that. And then you have two sizes. So you might say the hyperbolic distance. And then coming from the geometry, you're forced to use an um, arc gauche in terms of the discriminant. And this is on a rational geodesic. And then you would get your um, three halves plus epsilon instead when you're off. So if you use these choices that I feel like the geometry is asking you to use, then you get an analogous theorem, which is, so this theorem, I guess, this I should say is Harris, myself, and Steve Treadle, um, which is not exactly equivalent to the original, but is you know, very much the same in spirit. Um, but from this geometric perspective. So I think that's probably when I'm supposed to stop talking. <laughs> so we are going to try and use this uh, for questions. So if you have a question, I'll try and pass this back to you. Um, yeah, so questions. So, so in the quadratic case, you, you show this picture of this lattice, and then, and then you had the discriminant was a quadratic form, and then, and then like a kind of light cone. And, yep. and in the cubic case, I mean, is, you also have the lattice, 
in higher dimensions. What is the discriminant? Is it also a quadratic form or no, it's some other horrible, thing? No, it's this horrible convoluted thing now. Um, let's see, did I have, it's this. So, uh, so that's why it's, it's, it's somehow not exactly a Yeah, like it's, a not, it's no longer the like Minkowski geometry. Right. It's nothing I so see. simple and pleasing. And you don't have, I mean, they obviously still play with the hyperbolic geometry because you can see how they're avoiding the quadratics and stuff in the picture. Mm -hmm. But the actual geometric map from your coefficient space to your root space is much more complicated to describe. And, but we do that in the paper and then we, we throw up our hands at degree four because it's just getting more and more complicated. It's like solving the cubic is harder than solving the quadratic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So in the picture of the cubic roots, maybe, okay, maybe you addressed this already, I missed it. In the picture of the cubic roots, uh, it looks like the gaps or sort of structure twists in one direction or the other, depending on where you are. And this twisting, like uh, in this picture, these like um, stars like that look like they're rotating? Right, and so I um, was curious about whether the, you said that in the paper you actually do sort of work out the geometry relevant to cubic roots, and I was wondering whether that twisting is showing some kind of like chirality or that comes from the geometry or some sort of um, I mean. Yes, because this is a picture of what the geometry is doing, but there's an interesting caveat, which is that to draw this picture, we, uh, we took a box of coefficients and we stopped outside the box. And so you actually see um, fragments of, uh, I, what's the word um, that I'm looking for? You know, the, the effects from that. Um, that. That edge of that box is actually like these corners that you're seeing when you're looking in this region right here. So there is a twisting going on, but your, only, your eye only notices it because of the algorithm that we used was a box. And you wouldn't see it quite so obviously right here otherwise, okay. I think. Should, um, should I be thinking that the, sort of the, the twisting is coming from the shape of the box rather than the shape of the no, space itself? No, it's, it's, it's both. Your eye mm -hmm. picks up on it because of the shape of the plots. But there really is something in the geometry that's doing that. Um, and you see it here as well, like these sorts of twistings going on right here, for example. And then in some of these ones, too, you can see, like, through the origin, you don't see it. But this one, which is a plane outside the origin, you start to see very clearly there's something going on there, right? Um, oops. And you can kind of see here, actually. <laughs> That's even maybe the best illustration, because this is a very little piece of that geometric map, and you can definitely see why you're seeing twisting. So yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting, because there's, a, there's these moments, the special point in the middle here is a special moment where you're actually looking straight down a line through the lattice and it's all mapping to one point. That doesn't happen in the quadratics. But in the cubics, you can have a, a line in the lattice of rational slope which just ends up mapping straight down to a point. So you've got fibers that are different. Yeah, so there's a lot more going on in the cubic case. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, um, if not, let's thank Catherine again. <laughs>